الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد This درس from the سبب of us sitting here is the love for Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and from the thamarat or the fruit of us sitting here should be an increase of the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So when you sit in this dars, I want you guys to forget about everything else. And you don't think about your homes or works or jobs or stress or if you got to go to the bathroom or something, go. Right? If you got something else to do, go. We don't need you. <laughs> you are and I am in need of the dars. The dars is not in need of me or you. Subhanallah, from the sabab of loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is understanding how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And from that is understanding the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We spoke about Adam alayhi salatu salam and he is a common ancestor for all of us. Alhamdulillah. And then we spoke about Nuh alayhi salatu salam and we said he's also a common ancestor, him and his, yani the people that were saved with him, yani from them, we all began again. From past that, we look at Sam. I mean, now we talked about the different sons of Nuh alayhi salam. We're not studying like the history of the world, so I'm not going to go over the other ones, but I'm going to focus on the ones that are related to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. No doubt, across the board, the ulema of tarikh have said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is from the lineage of Sam. Yani his ancestry reaches Sam, the son of Nuh. From Sam came the Arab. But not just the Arab. I mean, I want you to understand, Bin Israel and many other uh, aqwam, they also came from Sam. And we, I mean, there is rawayat on this and that discuss and opinions and things. It's not, it's not really relevant. What's relevant is no doubt this is from the lineage that Rasulullah Sallallahu came with. Now, the actual lineage by name we will cover in a separate das and how much of it can be established from Sahih Hadith and where there is da'af and so on. But I did not find any khilaf that, that no doubt Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi came from these. But from where? Say the Arab, and this is, uh, I know I'm going to hurt some people's nationalistic pride today, so I might as well apologize now. The Arab, they are of three types. Okay, when you say you're an Arab, what does that mean? Right? And I would say, and this is what I said in the last session, this dars, I'm going to say there's four types. I'm going to, I'm going to add, inshallah, one more. None of this is from like a Sahih Hadith or something. It's not in the Quran, the Arab are three types. The Rasulullah didn't say the Arab are three types. This has to do with the ulema of tarikh, ulema of yani, history. But it is based on aqwal from Sahaba and Tabi'un and so on, explaining, and from the Qur'an itself, explaining history. And the ulema then break it down to kind of explain it. Okay? But I just want to be clear because somebody might be like, oh, where's your dalil? Arab of three types. So, Tariq al-Umam wal muluk of al-Tabari, Imam al-Tabari, the great scholar, he says, Ittafiq al-Rawaq wal-Ahl al-Khabar. Yani the people of Rawaya and, and, and the Khabar, yani those ulema of Tariq, have come to a consensus. Yani they're all that the Arab are taqseem of, upon the taqseem of the Arab. So, the ulema of tarikh, the scholars of history, do not have any khilaf on this issue, by agreement. And, uh, yani when I looked at the adilla they provide, they provide adilla from the Quran, and we'll talk about that, about the different nations, and from Sahih Ahadith, and so on. Now, when we go to the Arab, I said there are three types, and they are from the children of Sam, from the children of Nuh. Tayyib. There is Arab al Ba'ida. Arab al Ba'ida. Al Ba'ida are the original Arab, and they are today finished. Alema across the board, uh, like uh, Dr. Ali and others who've written about the Arab Qabl al Islam and so on, they say this, but I will explain a little bit, not that their traces are totally finished, but in general they're finished. And who were they? From the, the Qawm of Ad, 
Samud, uh, other Aqwam like uh, Abil, like uh, Hasis, uh, sorry, Hasids, which are now splinter groups. Jurham is one of these, but the seed of Jurham will go forward. Other than that, they finished. Uh, hadith, for example, this was a group uh, that they, they were there, and most of the ulema today will put them as jadis. Jadis. Even though, as I said, different names have come and different yani, ulema will give different other su subgroups. Jadis, for example, they said because of a genocide, they finished. Right? Abil, due to wars, they finished. So those are historic reports. We don't really have hadith on them. Regarding Ad and Thamud, these two are from this group. And they also are finished, but they are finished due to divine wrath by the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the adilla for that in the Quran itself. Right? We know Qawm al-Ad was uh, yani, from the aqwam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Hud, for example, and, and to them sent uh, was the Nabi Hud, and he gave them da'wah. And these were a people that were very strong. Like now, we look at the development of insan, yani how humans develop. And different humans develop in different ways. Yani again, depending on their atmosphere, depending on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for them. Some of them became very large and strong. Some of them different in their trade. Some of them very advanced in technology, even this long ago. Yeah, like we see today, right? So the Qawm of Ad, they were given an amazing amount of strength. Like they were physically very strong. And they were yani, uh, not just strong, they were intelligent as well from the worldly perspective. And Thamud on the other hand, Thamud were not physically strong. The Qawm of Thamud, we don't see a lot of uh, yani discussion about their physical strength, but they were given what we would consider today technology. They were very advanced. And they were given Salih was sent to them. And you see interestingly, Akhahum, yani Allah SWT talks about, uh, for example, Hud, Akhahum, their brother. But just on a side note, when you look at Lut, he was not from the Qawm of Lut. Because Alhamdulillah, Allah SWT yani sent them somebody pure. Tayyip, Khair, Ad and Thamud, both of them were given what we would see today as strength, right? Like today, when people talk bad about Muslims, like a lot of times, yani, especially from the, uh, our sellout Muslims, they talk about, man, look at you guys sitting around whatever you're doing and talking about Sira and you're talking about Wudu and Salah and these kinds of things. Look how technologically advanced country XYZ is and how Fulan reached this height and they have these many space shuttles and this and that. Or this other nation, look how strong they are, look at their military, look at their air force, look at their yani, navy or whatever else. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set such a beautiful example for us. Aad, physically stronger than anybody of the time. Nobody could take them on in battle. Right? And Thamud, technologically the most advanced at that time. Both of them, failures. Why? Destroyed. No sign is left of Aad. Thamud, there are still, yani you can go and find their dwellings and, and, and you, if you do go there, you should go there to cry. Not to go snap pictures. This is a, a disease in the Ummah today. People go to the pyramids in Egypt. And this is a place of Fir'aun. Why are you proud of it? And then they're proud of it. Fir'aun? You want to be proud of Fir'aun? You're not proud of Musa a.s. And they go to the place of Fir'aun and they're taking pictures and they, they're putting their hands as if it's in the Sphinx's mouth or it's on top of the pyramid. These are places where Ammon were destroyed. The place of Samud, if you go there, go there to cry. And this is one of the places you, you shouldn't even go and drink water from. I mean, the fiqh ahkam I'm not going to get into, but... This is the weakness of our Ummah's understanding today. They become proud of those that Allah destroyed like Fir'aun. And they forget about the lesson that was supposed to be taught. So these people were the strongest and most technologically advanced. But what was their downfall? What was their stupidity? Excuse my language. It was they didn't recognize their Rabb. 
If you don't know who created you, you don't know why you're here on earth, you don't know what the purpose of your existence is, you're a moron. <laughs> you can get double, triple PhDs, you could be a, a, a you could have a hundred billion dollars, you could own Bezos and, what's the other guy? Gates and all these guys and, uh, I don't know who else is rich nowadays, right? Was uh, Musk, right? Uh, Atar. You can own all of them and have ten times what they have, but you're a moron. You don't know why you exist. And this is a lesson that we miss. Khair. So those, those were the Arab al baida And most of them finished. Some of them through divine wrath, some of them through wars and genocide and so on. And most of the ulema of tariq said that they finished. Today we don't see any of them. But as I was researching for this uh, dars again, I mean, I would say that Jurhum, a part of them lived on. Okay? And that's where we get to the second type of Arab, which is Arab, al Ariba. Ariba, Arab, yani, this is to say that they were desert dwellers. They were where there was nothing. They were where it was like, you know, there were no maps. And the ulema of tariq like Tabari and others, uh, they've said that these were the generations to be born from Ismail السلام, marrying from Jurhum. So there is Pahtan, they're known as Pahtani Arabs. Um, and he is one of the people in the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Araba min awlad Pahtan. In Ya'rab, which is before that and so on. So from those generations. But what is general is that Ibrahim alayhi salam was not Arab. I mean, if you look at most of the ulema of tariq, when they speak about his language and his background, he was not Arab. Ismail alayhi salam was not Arab ethnically. I don't know, I'm blowing, I like film people of that, that emoji, you know, right? But it's true. Ismail alayhi salam married when he was in Mecca from the Bedouins that came from Jurhum tribe, and from them he learned Arabic. So from his generations came the second tabaqa or second class or second uh, generation or whatever you want to say of the Arab. Second classification. Those Arab were there and then you have musta'araba. Yani those that were from the later children of Ismail alayhi salam that now are Arab because they married in to the Arab tribes. So you have these three tabaqat of the Arab. Okay? Now, a fourth I will add, which usually gets put in here, but really deserves to be a separate category, is the ones that were musta'araba ba'd al-futuhat al islami Those that became Arab after the Islamic victories. Okay? So let me explain. So you have the original Arab al baida finished, pretty much. Then you have the second Araba, who are from the children of Ya'rab and Qahtan. From them, Jurham's lineage comes and marries into Ismail alayhi salam. Yani Ismail alayhi salam marries from them. And from Ismail alayhi salam, the lineage that comes forward is called Musta'araba. So these are the three. From them, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam comes from those Musta'araba. Yani from Ismail alayhi salam's lineage. Okay? From them were the people that are all going to originate from Jazeera al-Arab towards the east. Yani, if you look at the Araba, they're all going to be originally from Yemen. If Yemen was the heartland, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he make the affairs of Yemen easy today, and bring peace and tranquility back to Yemen. This was where the Arab began. Now, if anybody is from the land of Sham, or Morocco, or Egypt, or Northern Africa, or if you go into most of what we're considered Arab in, in the land of Iraq today, unless they are from the Bedouin tribes, unless you can trace it back, like in Jordan, for example, they have tribes that you can trace back to the original Yani Musta'arab Arab, or in Iraq as well. But most of those are not actual Arabs. I mean, they are Arab, but not DNA-wise, right? So this is interesting to understand. What do you consider to be a part of a particular race? Like what factors do you consider? Different races have different ideas. For example, 
mostly in the West, we look at DNA. Right? If somebody is by, if you do a DNA test and they turn out to be, you know, whatever percentage from a certain DNA family, then they consider you to be part of that race. But that's not always the case, right? If you were to take that definition, again, I apologize if anybody needs to drink some water or sit down, go ahead. If you take that definition of a DNA test, then I mean, the vast, vast majority of who consider themselves Arab today are not Arab. Like in, in Egypt, most are Coptic, ethnically, not, not religiously, ethnically. And they had their own language until Islam went to Egypt and Islam spread and Arabic spread. North Africa, hardly any of them are going to be actual ethnic Qabail Arab. Arab are all Qabail, Arab are all tribes. Like there are different types of people in the world. Some people are tribal, some people are non-tribal. North Africa has had their own. The Arab, they were the ones that went to North Africa, but most of them that speak Arabic today were either Barbar, which is Amazigh, yani, or other people, other Aqwam that were there, and they picked up Arabic, and some of them call themselves Arab today, some of them still call themselves Amazigh, but they speak Arabic. The same is true for most of North Africa. You see a lot of people very proud of being Arab, and you're like, just letting you know, bro. <laughs> And if you look at Sham, for example, right? If you look at Sham, and again, there are those that may be from Arab tribe, but the majority of them, if you did a DNA test, they would not come out to be Arab. They would come out to be Europeans, a lot of them. I mean, don't forget that the uh, Roman Empire was pretty much centered around that area for a long time, and the trade and all of that, and you will find all kinds of different types of people. Now, races are different. This definition of a DNA test is a certain type of a definition. For example, Yehudis, Jews, they have a different definition of what it means to be Jewish. They say that you have to go by the mother, not the father, the mother. Now, most people, their lineage in most cultures, it goes by the father. If your father is a certain race, you are considered that race. But in the Yehud, it goes by the mother. And we had a gentleman come and discuss with us at the tables at Balboa Park recently. Unfortunately, the audio wasn't on, so we don't have a recording, but many of you were there. He was a Orthodox-ish Jew, and, and he explained, I mean, may Allah yani, guide him, and uh, it was very polite, and he explained that, and I asked him, why is that? I asked him, why is it that, that in, in the Yehudi race, you go by the mother? He said, well, we're not always sure who the father is, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's, that, look, that's not my answer, that's what he said. I look, I'm, brothers were there. Can I get a witness? So, I told him, Alhamdulillah, <laughs> in our nations, we're, we're always sure who the Father is, Alhamdulillah. But if you guys aren't, I understand. And if it's that big of a problem that you got to change your uh, genetic understanding of a race, eh, interesting. Khair, so that is theirs. Different people have different. What and who is an Arab? As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, al-Mustaqim, he discusses this issue. And there is a hadith that mentions whoever speaks Arabic is Arab. But that hadith is extremely weak. We cannot rely upon that hadith. But that concept is correct. The hadith is not established, but that concept is correct. Meaning today, whoever is fluent and, and speaks Arabic is Arab. He may not want to be Arab. Somebody may be like, no, I'm Kurdish, man, I'm good. I don't want to take title, right? It's up to you. But... If you speak Arabic, you're Arab. That's what the definition of Arab is today. Otherwise, if you're going to go to DNA, then you know, we're going to find very, very few actual, even from the Arab or Musta'arab. Tayyib. Ismail a.s. now, he learned Arabic, and that's where the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu being Arab came from. Tayyib. But again, how did we get to that point, like we were talking about the development of the lineage. Obviously, before that is Khalil al Rahman. Who's Khalil al Rahman? Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the father of the Arab, as we say. But do understand that doesn't mean he was Arab. From his lineage, from his children, from his generations came the Arab and bin Israel. Ani? The Bin Israel, and I'm not going to call them Yehudi because that's a religion. But Bin Israel also came. So from the children of, of Ibrahim السلام, came Ismail. Ismail السلام, learned Arabic, and from his lineage came the future of the Arabs. Musta'arab. 
and from his children is Ishaq. From Ishaq came Ben Israel. Ben Israel is called Ben Israel because Yaqub السلام, one of his names is Israel. And Israel in that language is Abdullah. See? So Bani Israel meaning from the children of Yaqub. Yaqub is the son of who? Ishaq. So this is that Ibrahim is then the father of both the Arab and Ben Israel. Tayyib. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. Subhanallah. How beautiful is the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. This is not a dars about his life, but we will cover it just a little bit يعني, to understand what, has, what is related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. The first thing, when we say Khalil, like usually we refer to Ibrahim alayhi salam as Khalil. What does it mean Khalil? Friends. So what is Siddiq? Friend. Malfarq. Friend. What's the difference? This is why the Arabic language is so beautiful and it should be understood so well. Everybody here calls Ibrahim Salam Khalilullah, Khalilur Rahman. But, but what does that really mean? And is he the only Khalil? La. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also Khalil of Allah. Some of the ignorant, this is the ignorance in our ummah today. Somebody sent me a clip from a Sira Dars. Yani may Allah guide the, yani me and them. They were saying, Ibrahim is the Khalil Allah and Rasulullah Sallallahu is the Mahbub Allah. Habib Allah. Wrong. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi the hadith is reported by Bukhari and Muslim. He said, Inna Allah qad attakhidhi, attakhadni, verily Allah Sallallahu Alaihi took me Khalila. As a Khalil, كما اتخذ, as he took Ibrahim Khalil, as he took Ibrahim as a Khalil. So just as Ibrahim is Khalil Allah, Rasulullah is Khalil Allah as well. Yeah. But what does Khalil mean? Ibn Hajar Asqalani, one of the great scholars of Islam, he said, Al Khalil, who is Siddiq, Al Khalis. Yani, he is a friend. But a special, a pure friend, the one that the love for him or her or them has taken root in the hearts. Okay? This is one thing to understand. Mullah Liqari, another great Hanafi ulema, Mullah Liqari, he said, A'lam, inna al farq bayna al khalil wal habib, inna al khalil man khilla ayy al haja. He says, what is the difference between the Khalil and the Habib? Is the Khalil is the one that there is, you have a need and they have a need. And I'll explain what that need is. Tayyip. These are some of the aqwal. We'll get into Qadi Ayyad and others, and Ibn Taymiyyah and others in a minute. But first, let's take it from a linguistic perspective. Right? What is the root word for Khalil? First thing, anybody know the Jama'a? Khulafa. <laughs> Khulan is one Jama'a. Akhilla is another Jama'a. Uh, Khalila is the Mwannaf. Khalilat is the Jama'a for the Mwannaf. The root word comes from Khulla. Khulla. Here, as Qadi Ayyad al-Maliki, he says, means an extreme love. By the way, Khalail is also another jama'ah, but tell you. So what does it mean? Khulla here, not the khulla of divorce. <laughs> khulla here is a, a great and intense love. Qadi Ayyad breaks it down. He says, if you take the root word here of Khalil, Khulla, but this is rab'a, and this is four letters. Kha, lam, lam, ta marbuta, which is the ha here, right? But you can take it to its root word. That's a beautiful thing about the Arabic language, right? You keep going, which is khil, not khal, that's vinegar, right? Khil here and khulla. So khil means something that is the most beloved or the favorite. Arabic would use your favorite. It also has a meaning of being in need of it or it only needing you. 
Okay? It's very uh, interesting. Interestingly, as Qadi Ayyad and others have mentioned, the khil also has a meaning of a worshipper. From khil comes khulla. Khulla here is taken as a pure love or somebody that is singled out amongst those that are loved. A love that has penetrated the heart. As Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, he says that Al Khalil wa Aqrab min al Mahboob. Khalil is somebody closer than the Mahboob. Yeah? But what is important here is Ibn Taymiyyah says one defining factor between Al Khalil and Mahboob, other than just being the intensity of how much you love them is that you and your Khalil are on the same path. You are in the same mindset, have the same direction. Homogeneity, I think they call it in English. Meaning your purpose and the Khalil that you take purpose is the same. Unlike Mahbu. Okay? For example, Ibn Al-Qayyim, he says that Al-Khalil is dearer to a person than Mahboob because of the common interests and values that they share. Somebody you don't know, you could love. How? how? For example, some people, they watch a lot of uh, useless TV, right? And they watch an actor. Now, they've never met that actor. They don't know anything about that actor. But if that actor plays a villain on TV, they hate that actor. Some people that always get the villain roles, they have to be careful, they go out somewhere, people attack them, you know. <laughs> the guy could be a really nice guy, but, right? Somebody plays the hero, or, you know, <coughs> heroine, or whatever, right? People fall in love with them. Hub. Right? But they don't know them. In reality, it's not a true love. Right? You could be, I love that football player, but maybe if you met him, and you found out what a jerk he is, you wouldn't love him. You love an actor, but maybe if you really met them and saw their personality, you wouldn't love them. Right? And this is why in Arabic you have to be very clear with the words you use. For example, Ishq. We some people, Ashik Rasul. Ishq in Arabic has a um, sexual connotation. You can look up any qamus you like, right? Ibn Qayyim says about Ishq, Ishq, Mar. Uh, uh, Ishq is such a, a, a disease that it, uh, uh, it, 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 it corrupts the hearts. So you can't use Ishq with like Islamic stuff. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and this is the ignorance of the languages people use it today, right? So Ishq is different, Hub is different, and Khulla is different. Here, Khalil cannot be on a different page than you. Right? And that's why some of the Imma said, this explains the hadith. Like, look at the hadith. Al maru ala dini khalili. Laysa ala mahboobihi. O siddiqihi. La khalili. Look at the beautiful. It's like when you understand the language, the hadith becomes clear, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, a person's upon the religion of his khalil. Because him and the Khalil are now going to be on the same page. Right? And that is why Al-Habib can have a different path. You could love somebody and you and them are not on the same page. Let's say you grew up with somebody or let's say somebody's a relative of yours and you weren't Muslim at the time or you were away from the deen and then you become Muslim or you, or you come back to the deen and, and you love them because you've had those experiences with them or whatever the good that they did towards you. But you're not on the same page, they will never be your khalil. Right? Somebody could be your friend in the sense that you work with them, that you go to school with them, that you play basketball with them. In that sense, you have a friendly relationship. But they could never be your khalil if they're not mu'mineen, if they're not people of iman, because then some kafir is not, never going to be on that same mindset as you. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu said, فَلْيَنْدُرْ أَحَدُكُمْ One of you should care for man يُخَلِّلْ Yukhalil, yani who you take as a Khalil. Look out at that. Watch out. Be careful. Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, he's Khalil al-Rahman. But why? 
I mean, this is where we don't realize the value of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ibrahim alayhi salam, Inna Ibrahim kana ummah. Verily, Ibrahim alayhi salam was an ummah. What does that mean? Yani, does that mean he had many women and men and children within him? La. Yani, an ummah here, first and foremost meaning he was a leader. This is one of the meanings people miss in the Bible Tafsir. Ibrahim alayhi salam for, I mean, I'm going to try to say it in words that we understand today. He wouldn't fall for peer pressure. Meaning he was a leader when he knew something to be right, something to be on truthfulness, he would stand on it, not caring what anybody thought. Not his people, not his peers, not his father, because his father was not a believer. So here Ibrahim والسلام, he stood up against everybody as a leader and he left and he continuously moved whenever Allah ordered him. Qanita, yani, lillahi hanifa. Qanita, yani, somebody who is devoted towards the obedience. Not just obedient, but, yani, there is a difference. Let me give an example, right? You tell somebody, hey, can you give me some water? And they're like, ah. Ah. yeah. And they get up and bring you water, right? And there is somebody else that sees you before you say, can you go bring me some water? They get up and bring you water. And there's a big spectrum between those two. <laughs> but this is a, a devoted love and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hanifa, what does that mean? That he was upon Tawheed. Not that he was from the Hanafi Madhab, just <laughs> some people are like, look, she followed the Hanafi Madhab. Ibrahim alayhi salam followed it. Right, right. La, I and mean, this is upon Tawheed, and he was not min al mushrikeen. You cannot call. I mean, look at the, the 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 opposition given here. One that he's on Tawheed, and definitely not from the people of Shirk. So, if you want to be Khalil of Rahman, look at the qualities that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Shakiran, and he was thankful for what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala blessed him with. Right. So he was a leader. Somebody could stand up by himself, didn't care about what people thought. When he saw something was right, he by himself was an ummah. He was enough to be a nation by himself. He was devoted, obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, upon tawheed, away from shirk, and thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are just some of the qualities we can see of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. But first and foremost, when we look at the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, as mentioned in the Quran and Sahih Ahadith and the Aqal of Sahaba and so on, we find that it begins with him amongst his own people in what would be current day Iraq. And here we see that as Ibn Jawzi has mentioned and Ibn Kathir and Al-Tabari and Al-Qurtabi and others that his father was a, a priest and a person who made their living off of taking care of and having idols. Right? And this is something that it's very difficult to imagine because those of us that are blessed with Muslim parents and pious parents, you don't know what a blessing that is because a parent is somebody you should look up to. A parent is somebody that a person usually does look up to. But when your parent is somebody promoting shirk. Not just that he was a mushrik, but promoting shirk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Ibrahim alayhi salam that he would be from the people that would call towards Tawheed. So he had to stand up to his own father. Now, here I want to make clear. Some of the people, they say that the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam was not Azim. Like we have it in the Quran. Right? But, mashallah, some people, they apparently know better. And they say, no, well, any ab father can be used uh, majazan, and somebody could use it for their grandfather or their uncle, or maybe it was, maybe it was, or maybe it was a, well, maybe it was a cousin, maybe, maybe it was just a nice guy down the street. <laughs> um, and, and they do this because sometimes uh, 
they, they take an opinion and then they love that opinion even when it's wrong and then when you go around and give them evidences then they have to get around the evidences <laughs> so these people for example they say the parents of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi are in Jannah they were believers and you tell them but Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself yani he said that your parents and my parents even which we'll discuss in the seerah inshallah when he wanted to visit the grave of his mother and make dua for her Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said Allah didn't allow me to make dua for her why would Allah not allow him to make dua for his mother except that she died in a state of shirk right but then they become upset how could it be oh, you know if Allah ordered it any lineage and, and blood ties are not what makes you successful it is your aqidah and your belief and your amal and then we tell them what about Ibrahim alayhi salam now they're caught because Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran right now they will say, oh no, 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 how should we get around this? Uh, it wasn't his dad. Allah SWT said in the, in the Quran, well, it could mean something else. So here, Ibn Kathir, he says, Sawab in the ismuhu Azir. That his name was Azir. Although in uh, different books it's been given as Izar, Azar, and Azir. All of those have been mentioned. And he has also a, a laqab and another name which is Tarih which has been given in the books of Tarikh. And this is not something strange. As we mentioned, Israel and Yaqub, the same person. Having a name and having a, a title is not something strange. As Ibn Khattab has said, his name is Azir, as is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Tabari and others have mentioned this as well. So his father's name is Azir, as in the Quran, and he stood up to his father. Now, this is a very difficult thing to do. And, and, and I want to make a point because how many believers does he have with him? None. In the beginning, none. Right? So the entire society, his own household, his own father, are all on shirk. And his father has the most to gain from shirk and the most to lose from shirk being eradicated. Because that's his livelihood. Right? And this is one of the problems we see when people make religion their li livelihood. They're afraid to accept or speak the truth because then it affects their bread on their table. Right? So here, Ibrahim is guiding. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides him. But he has to stand up against the entire society. Now, why am I emphasizing on this? Because today, every one of us sitting here is thinking, I would do that. And if I was Ibrahim alayhi salam, yeah, and I would be like, Dad, this is wrong. Let me break them idols. Like, I'm the same as him. I'm Khalid. Right? But today, when somebody asks you about LGBT, you start stuttering. Right? Let's be honest. You make conferences about it, and then you just, you know, drive around. Somebody asks you about Hadood, you're like, ah, 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 ah. You're not able, with, with all these masajid and millions of Muslims and in America and a billion, two billion, one and a half billion, whatever around the world and ulama and du'at and all this stuff with you and you're not able to stand up on Islam. You're afraid of fundings, you're afraid of labels, you're afraid of whatever else you're afraid of other than Allah, but you're afraid of all those things. Our imma, our leaders out there yeah, trying to find the tightest suits that they can wear and the cleanest shaves that they can have. And how, how small can I get my beard and still be considered? Like, you know, I, I shaved earlier this morning and now a little bit stubble has come. That's a beard. And they know better. But why? Because the societal pressure. They can't stand to it. Now imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam. One man. That's why he was an ummah by himself. Everybody's against him. He sees the haq, he stands on. Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was constantly on the go. Constantly making hijrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs me here, I'm here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs me there, I'm there. He's not like, okay, well, what about my, I had an appointment. I got a, I got a hair salon appointment. It's very hard to get into, man. You know, I've got this, I've got that. No. Today you tell somebody, let's go for hajj. Like, what hajj? I'm not even telling you to make hijra or anything. I'm just saying, go for hajj. Hajj? My granddaughter's not married yet. <laughs> I heard a fatwa that if my granddaughter's not married, then I can't go for hajj. I've got debts. Like, what debt? My granddaughter's not married yet. <laughs> How's that a debt? <laughs> Are you selling your granddaughter? Are you buying a son in law? I don't know what's going on here. Anyway. So when we are at this stage, and then you wonder, 
he was thrown in the fire. The fire didn't burn him. What if I get thrown? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> right? Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about him, Ibrahim, kana siddiqan nabiya. Siddiq here, here has a meaning that is uh, يعني, very deep. Sadiq, Siddiq come from the same root. And here, when we take it to be the meaning of honesty, that he was honest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was a friend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was somebody who stood up and fulfilled his promises. Meaning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him, he passed his test. Today we get tested and we fail and fail and fail miserably. And we still ask Allah for mercy. I'm not saying that يعني, we should give up hope. But these, these should motivate us to appreciate that when we get faced with some kind of hardship, how can we be honest? And that's why al Dhahabi, Imam al Dhahabi says about Ibrahim alayhi salam. He says that he was implementing here the Amr bin Maruf and Nahal Munkar by breaking the statue. This is what the, يعني, the implementation was coming. That against all odds, he went and did what he was ordered to do. Now think about that as an ummah. Today, if you are by yourself, in an entire society against you, your father against you, your family against you, the government against you, the king against you, the military against you, no supporters. The only person from his own people that believed in him was Lut, and that was later. So in the beginning it was just him. Right? Even then, he went into their place of worship and broke their idols. He didn't steal them and sell them. <laughs> he didn't go and try to... And today in our ummah, Oh yeah, I'm going to go there. You know where I'm going. Right? Today in our ummah, when you have an entire land of Muslims, I mean they're Muslims, you don't actually have anybody worshipping this big thing in a mountain there. I mean there's nobody that's there, that lives there, that even goes and worships it. It's not even a church or a temple. It's just a big old statue on the side of a mountain. And some people say, hey, you know what, why do we have a big old shirk idol on the side of a mountain? Let's get rid of it, right? Hey, no, 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 no. I can't believe they did that. <laughs> they could have sold it. Oh yeah, that's great. So they can worship it somewhere else. <laughs> One of the great uh, personalities in Islamic history from Afghanistan, he conquered India. And when the statues were brought to him, I mean, these were gold and amazing and whatever, very valuable statues to the Hindus, right? And the people told him, hey, you know what, don't break them, because you can sell them. The Hindus came, they said, oh, we got money, Hindus got money, <laughs> we got money, we'll buy them from you, we'll buy them for great amounts of money. He said, I would rather be remembered in history as the breaker of statues, not the seller of statues. SubhanAllah, today when in our ummah they were about to break this, how many Muslim scholars, scholars, right, were like, no, 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 sell it. Get that money and feed the poor kids that are starving. Yes, you want to feed our poor starving kids shirk money? You think barakah is going to come in our land from that? Take that money and build masajid. Yes, yes, we're going to get money from selling idols and build masajid with them. Today we have conferences in America of our imams and imma talking about the horrible crime committed against humanity by breaking a statue and, and they talk about how Islam orders us to protect. What? What are you talking about? Come on. Right? You think Rasulullah went into the Kaaba and said, hey, who wants to buy this statue going once, going twice? Is there a bidding war? La. Khwan fillah. These cannot be story tales. These cannot be entertainment. We have to take lessons from this and we'll end here inshallah ta'ala and pick up with the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam in the next verse.